Well, according to the Journal of Humor Research, American adults laugh 17 times a day. Doesn't seem like very much, does it? So, in a moment, we are going to hear the Apostle Paul tell us that 17 times might not be enough, especially if few of those occurrences of laughing includes laughing at ourselves. Because laughing at ourselves is a much bigger challenge that la as, than laughing at other people. And so, for Father's Day, to help bring this number up a little bit, we have a video that might help especially might help us men in the room laugh at ourselves just a bit, laugh at what for many of us is probably an awkward challenge, and that is having that heart-to-heart -heart talk with our dads about how much they mean to us. In fact, this video might help you lighten up a bit, might help you put that in perspective, break the ice, and maybe have a conversation this afternoon. Dad, I'm just going to say it. I don't know why it's hard for me to talk real with you, but it is. And all we ever do is talk weather and sports and sports and weather, and that's it. I don't know. What I really want to say is I'm thankful for how you loved me growing up, and you always made time for me, and I love you. Happy Father's Day. That was really good. You think? Yeah, you need to tighten it up a little bit, but other than that, you're ready. Okay, thanks, Uncle Ron. Here goes. Dad. Son. Looks like the uh, clouds are rolling in. Yeah, hope they don't postpone the game tonight. Listen, Dad, I wanted, to, I wanted to say something to you. Okay. Just, I just want to thank of you for, well, thank you for being, you know, a, a dad. Not, not just a dad, you know, being, for being one that's mine and not, well, of course not just mine. You're Jessica and Jordan's dad too, but it's, it's cool. Matthew. I, I, yes, sir. I know. Dad, I, I don't think you do know. No, oh, no, I know. I heard you talking to Uncle Ron. I was sitting just four feet from you. Well, I meant it. Thank you. Well, it turns out that things were also awkward among the brand new Christian believers who lived in the prosperous Greek city of Corinth in the first century. But the awkwardness in their case is a little different. The awkwardness in Corinth is because even in this young congregation, there are already factions, factions in the church who quarrel with one another. That's not something we've ever experienced, is it? Well, the Apostle Paul had started this church in Corinth during his second missionary journey. And what we know as the biblical book of 1 Corinthians is really his letter that he writes a few years later. He's in Ephesus at that point, and he writes back to the church in Corinth. Well, in 1 Corinthians, Paul does not beat around the bush. After his obligatory greetings, right here in the first chapter, he dives right in. And he tells his friends in Corinth that he has heard through the grapevine about these factions. He has heard how each one of these Corinthian Christians struts around bragging about their superior doctrine and bragging about which apostle they learned from and which apostle they follow. Some strut around saying, well, we belong to Paul. And there's another faction that walks around saying, well, we belong to Peter. And another says, we belong to Apollos. And then there's a fourth group that is apparently trying to trump everyone and says, well, we belong to Christ. 
Well, generations of New Testament scholars have speculated over these quarrels and these arguments and exactly what they were saying. But this morning, I want to focus instead on Paul's prescription for all this quarreling. How they might become, as he says in verse 10, united in the same mind and the same purpose. He gives his prescription. Well, now you might expect Paul to write them something fairly serious, fairly sober. But instead, he tells them in what we're about to read, basically, guys, lighten up. Don't take yourselves so seriously. Well, if we want to hear this in Paul's words, you can turn to page 166 in that Bible that's in the pew pocket in front of you. This is 1 Corinthians first chapter, so 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. Listen to what Paul says. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Well, where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let no one who boasts boast in the Lord. Will you pray with me? God, as we turn together to consider this text of Scripture that you've given us, God, open our hearts and open our ears that we might hear your transforming word to us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, appropriately enough, this sermon began as something of a joke. It was a few months ago, and Doug and I were putting the worship schedule together, and he said, hey, David, you want to preach on this Sunday in June? And you can do something um, that you want to do, or if you want to, you can wrap up this series that I'm going to be doing, this series called This Way Up. And I thought about it, and I said, well, Doug, by that point, you will have done called to give up, called to keep up, called to shut up, and called to stand up. The only thing I could think of that would be left would be called to lighten up. And he looked at me, and he said, that's it. I dare you. But as I thought about it, I realized, you know, as followers of Jesus Christ, we really are called to lighten up. I realized that this habit we have of taking ourselves far too seriously is one of those things that holds us down, that keeps us from experiencing and discovering all that Christ wants us to experience. Not only that, it is, as Paul says, the cause of a whole lot of conflict among us here in the community of faith. Well, apparently that was the case there in Corinth. There were people walking around full of their own importance, full of their own um, opinions, basically full of themselves. And if you wanted to sum up what Paul writes them in this passage that we just read, it would be basically, 
Guys, lighten up. Stop taking yourself so seriously. Because Paul tells them, you want to know the truth? All of us are a whole lot more ridiculous than we even know. And if you want to experience the full and the true love of God in Jesus Christ, if you want this way up, you're going to have to stop and step back and learn to laugh at yourselves. Learn to laugh. I have a question. Are you surprised to find here in the Bible that message, learn to laugh? Because many would find that surprising. Many have grown up with the assumption that the Bible, by and large, is a humorless book. And to be a good Christian, you basically have to take on that attitude. You need to be sober and serious, sometimes even dour. This is an assumption that started early in the history of the church. The first monastic rule, or the first um, monastic manual, was written by St. Benedict. And in it, he adopted St. Chrysostom's Theology of Tears, which meant for the monks that were coming into the monastery, he expected them to practice the imitation of Christ, who, he said, never laughed expected them to endure suffering as they wait for the return of Christ in this veil of tears and as the world persecutes them. Well, I think that monks did some beautiful things, but laughing was not really their strong suit. But, of course, our own particular Protestant forebearers, the Calvinists, were not exactly known for their levity either. One of the reasons they carried around their King James Bibles and they read Ephesians 5, 4, where Paul warns against foolish talking and jesting. And they took that very seriously. Problem is that in that particular passage, Paul is really talking about vulgar or destructive jokes. And sure, that's fair enough. We all know that humor can degrade and humor can hurt. But that's not the humor that I'm talking about. The humor I'm talking about builds up, and it refreshes, and it renews, and it helps us get a whole new, fresh perspective on our lives and on ourselves. It's what I would call godly humor. And I think it is a key ingredient of the life of discipleship. I'd go even further, and I would say that humor is more than just an occasional um, something, an occasional feature in Scripture that you get now and then. It is infused throughout the whole story of Scripture from the beginning to end if you have eyes to see it. If you were here in March, Matt Pooley and I did a worship series on the Old Testament book of Jonah. And you might remember that each week we made the claim that the best way, the most helpful way to read that particular book is as a wickedly funny satire of our own tendency towards smugness. Do you remember that first passage, that first chapter? There was this group of pagan sailors who were more faithful than God's prophet Jonah. And then in the middle there was that fish who after listening to Jonah's somewhat hypocritical prayer vomited him out. Then there was that great last scene where there were all these Assyrian cows who put on sackcloth and ashes in order to teach Jonah and, by extension, all of God's people what it means to repent. Jonah is a funny book, and it is meant to help God's people learn how to laugh at themselves in the most healthy and helpful way. Well, I don't think Jonah's an anomaly in Scripture. Humor begins in Genesis and it carries throughout Scripture. Think about it. This whole Bible is the story of Abraham's offspring, and now we're part of that. Well, Abraham's offspring, his son, is Isaac, and does anyone know what the name Isaac means? It means laughter. Isaac is God's outrageous joke. And if you know the story, Sarah is 95 years old when she has Isaac. Nobody expects it. She, um, when she hears about God promising, has this uh, somewhat bitter skeptical laugh. And then God takes that laughter and makes it into the main punchline of the whole story and in fact tells Sarah to name the kid laughter, Isaac. Well, in Hebrew, that's Yitzhak. 
And it's one of those delightful words that sounds like what it means. Yitzhak, 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 that's okay. I think the Old Testament is full of humor. There are puns, and there is wordplay, and there's irony, and there is outrageous stories, and there are bumbling heroes. There's that great story of a donkey who actually talks back to its errant owner, who is the prophet Balaam. There is a wonderful story of the Philistines capturing Israel's Ark of the Covenant, putting it in their shrine, and their statue of their god Dagon every night falls over and worships it. <laughs> and then, kids, don't listen. There's this great scene where uh, young David is on the run, and he's hiding in a cave, and it just happens to be the cave where his arch nemesis, King Saul, chooses for his royal potty break. But I think the funniest book of all is Proverbs, which actually tells us that a merry heart is good medicine. Well, the sages that put these Proverbs together came up with them some gems, and here's three of them. Whoever rises early in the morning to bless his neighbor with a loud voice will be counted as cursing. <laughs> or this one. As the door turns on its hinges, so does a lazy person in bed. The lazy person puts his hand into the dish, but is too tired to bring it back to his mouth. <laughs> Finally, there's this one, which probably isn't so appropriate for Father's Day. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the humor's not just in the Old Testament. It carries through into the New Testament. It carries through into the story of the early church. The book of Acts, for instance, is full of these really funny stories. Toward the end of Acts, there's this scene. They're up on a second floor, and Paul's preaching, and there's an open window, and there's a young man, Eutychus, sitting in the window, and Paul drones on on and on in his sermon, and Eutychus falls asleep and falls apparently to his death and needs to be miraculously revived. Well, to a preacher, that's a really funny story. <laughs> or... Also in Acts, there's this great scene where Peter, an angel, frees Peter from prison, and he leaves the prison, and he runs, and he goes to try to find where the disciples are hiding, and he finds it, and he knocks on the door, and this maid named Rhoda comes to the door and says, who's there? And he says, Peter, and she's so excited that she leaves him stranded there on the porch for 10 minutes while she goes and runs and tells all of the other disciples. These are funny stories. And then there's Jesus. The one whom these monks claimed never laughed. Well, I don't buy it. I think Jesus laughed and the people around him laughed. In fact, I think the first time people heard almost every one of his parables, people would have laughed because these are funny stories with an outrageous twist at the middle of most of them. One source that I found, a guy named Steve Belinsky, even points out that Jesus stooped to the occasional pun. Matthew 23, 24 is funny even in English. It, in it, Jesus portrays the legalistic Pharisees as fastidious diners, carefully eating soup and straining out a gnat from their soup, but in the process, swallowing a whole camel. That's kind of funny. Well, in Aramaic, the word gnat, then Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke, the word gnat is galma, and the word camel is gamla. I guess you had to be there. And I guess you have to speak Aramaic. <laughs> From time to time in worship, I have used the Visual Bible's excellent film portrayal of the Gospel of Matthew. And one of the things that it depicts so well is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I love how it captures the mirth and the humor that I think was part of Jesus' teaching. So I want you to listen to just three verses and watch three verses from the Visual Bible. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? <laughs> How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? <laughs> 
when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you hypocrites. <laughs> First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is that how you've imagined the Sermon on the Mount? I love that because I'm convinced that Jesus not only caused others to laugh, but laughed himself. In fact, Jesus quotes his enemies as accusing him of not being serious enough. He quotes the Pharisees as saying that Jesus is a glutton and a drunkard. Well, he's neither, of course, but he must have been having some fun with those disciples to be accused of that. All that to say, I believe that humor is something that God has created, that God has blessed, and that God has given to us for a reason. And going back to this passage here in Corinthians, one of the best reasons that God gives us humor is so that we can learn to laugh at ourselves. Brothers and sisters, Paul writes in verse 26, consider your own call, look at yourselves, and think about this crazy fact that of all the people in the world, it is you that God has called to be part of his people. Now that's funny. <laughs> Were any of you wise according to the world? No. Were any of you powerful? No. Were any of you of noble birth? No. Is there any reason at all that you should be chosen? No. And yet, God has chosen you. New Testament scholars are fairly sure that each of Paul's letters that he wrote, when they arrived at their destination, when they arrived at the congregation to which they were addressed, that congregation would gather together and someone would stand up and unseal the letter and read it. What do you think happened that day in Corinth when Paul's letter arrived and they gathered to read it? You've got to imagine the scene. Maybe they're in their fellowship hall. They're all sitting in their seats. And of course, they're sitting with their own factions. There's some anxiety in the room. There's some stress. People are worked up. People are a little irritated. People are angry. And then someone stands up and unseals the letter and starts reading and almost immediately gets to this line. In you, Corinthians... God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. What do you think happened? Well, the way I imagine the scene, there's a collective gasp, and people stiffen up, and they sit up really straight, and there are shocked expressions of affront and of insult, and then there is an awkward silence, and then, at least this is the way I see it, they're in the back trying to stifle it, someone starts to giggle. But they can't quite stop their giggling because it's too late and because across the room someone else starts giggling and then someone else and then someone else and then someone snorts and then everybody starts laughing and there is this rising crescendo of laughter, laughing so hard that the tears begin to flow and whatever factions were in that room that day in Corinth simply evaporate. Because that is the power of humor. Once you have laughed with someone, there's no going back. Laughter breaks down walls. It releases tension. It takes you outside of yourself so you can look back at yourself and see the pettiness and the ridiculousness of your quarrels. It makes being angry almost impossible. And dads, you know this. I know every one of you have experienced this situation. You're trying to be parental. You're trying to be stern and serious. And you're giving the lecture, and the kid says something funny, and everyone starts laughing, and the lesson's over for the day. <laughs> have you been there? Humor simply changes our perspective. Paul knows that, and that's why he is writing, inviting his readers to laugh at themselves. He knows if they can get this joke, if he can get them to see the delightful absurdity and the sheer unexpectedness of their own calling, of the fact that they've ended up part of God's people at all, 
is going to mean that their own sense of entitlement, their own sense of pride, their own sense of self-importance is, is going to simply dissolve. And the only boasting that will be left will be to boast in the Lord. Well, Sandia Presbyterian Church, this is our calling too. We are called to lighten up. We're called to learn to laugh. We're called to laugh at the very craziness of this thing called grace and the very absurdity that ridiculous people like us has ended up in the middle of all this. We are called to learn to laugh at ourselves. And so, in the week ahead, I have a suggestion. I want you to think about some stressful situation in your life, maybe some vexing relationship, and I want to ask, what would it look like in that situation to learn to laugh at yourself, to lighten up, to take yourself a little bit less seriously, and maybe even bring that other person in on the joke? I want you to try it, because if Paul is right, and I think he is, there is a deep, mysterious connection between laughter and the gospel itself. And you know, that really shouldn't surprise us. I'm convinced that all great humor, all healing laughter points to God's best joke. The most wonderful and humorous irony in history is the great reversal of Easter, the great reversal at the end of the gospel story. Well, in his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale, Presbyterian pastor and novelist Frederick Beekner describes this mysterious connection. Is it possible, I wonder, to say that it is only when you hear the gospel as a wild and marvelous joke that you really hear it at all? Heard as anything else, the gospel is the church's thing, the preacher's thing, the lecturer's thing. But heard as a joke, high and unbidden and ringing with laughter, it is God's thing. And the comedy of all this is not the black comedy it might at first seem to Jew and Gentile alike who have learned of the world to see all things as black at last. But it's white comedy, high comedy, the high comedy of Christ that is as close to tears as the high comedy of Buster Keaton or Marcel Marceau or Edith Bunker is close to tears. But glad tears at last, not sad tears. Tears at the hilarious unexpectedness of things rather than their tragic expectedness. Because of the hilarious unexpectedness of God's love for each one of us in Jesus Christ, because of this incredible unexpected reversal, because of this best punchline ever, laughter is our birthright. And so, that means Christ himself has freed us to laugh at ourselves, to take ourselves a bit less seriously, even to lighten up. Will you pray with me? God, somehow, at the center of who you are, at the center of this mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, somehow in that relationship, there is laughter. There must be, because God, you have put your, built this laughter into every part of creation as it delights in you with ripples of worshipful, worshipful laughter. God, it must be the case, because in creating us in your image, you have created us to laugh. So God, we want to know, we want to learn to experience what it means to laugh with you to laugh deeply and richly and healingly. God, we do want to know what it looks like to take ourselves less seriously, to lighten up, and to learn to laugh with one another. And I pray that you help us do that in the week ahead, that we might discover even more the joy that you intend for us. In Jesus' name, amen.